Hey, I'm Kero Geshura and welcome to Let It Rip. We're coming to you from the CUNY TV studios in the shadow of the Empire State Building in New York City. Now, earlier this summer, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani was indicted in Georgia for his efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential elections in that state. Giuliani also faces several lawsuits that he incited the January 6th insurrection when he gave an incendiary speech at the Save America rally where he told those in attendance to, and I quote, let's have trial by combat. Now, some people have lamented Giuliani's fall from grace where he was once a celebrated former federal prosecutor, a two-term mayor of New York City who was also awarded Times Person of the Year. But for many black and brown New Yorkers, the traumatic days under Giuliani's mayoralty were filled with racist and dishonest political tropes. How can we forget Giuliani's role in inciting New York City's biggest police riot on September 16, 1992, where 10,000 mostly white off-duty police officers stormed an occupied city hall before heading to the Brooklyn Bridge where they jumped on cars and harassed several drivers. In the center of the mayhem, standing on top of a flatbed truck, alongside the Police Benevolent Association's president, Phil Caruso, screaming and cursing was Giuliani. Bullshit. Bullshit. So for many New Yorkers, January 6th looked and sounded all too familiar. Now here to help us discuss Giuliani's role in inciting both the 1992 NYPD riot and the January 6th Capitol insurrection is Ron Kuby, a civil rights attorney, and Mark Claxton, the Director of Public Relations and Political Affairs with the Black Law Enforcement Alliance and a retired NYPD detective. I'm Kero Gashoro, and this is Let It Rip. Mark, I'll start with you. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what happened on that September 16, 1992, when NYPD police officers were essentially just rioting in the streets? Well, I think it's important to consider the times and how significant the changes that had occurred in the city uh, for the previous uh, couple of years, being that we had elected a, a first black mayor and the, the attitude and the position that many of the, the police or law enforcement community had taken was uh, to be opposed uh, to this particular black mayor because there were some significant recommendations in as far as, as the Civilian Complaint Review Board recommendations and other recommendations about the structure of law enforcement agencies uh, that there was significant pushback from the uh, organizations and from the unions. And uh, there was heightened racial tensions because of historically what occurs in New York. We've had many significant cases of, uh, of police violence uh, in communities of color, some uh, disparate treatment, many disparate treatment cases, you know, before it was called this stop and frisk -ish situation. So there was heightened tensions. And, uh, and then there was... Uh, really this extra added uh, a point of, of contention that we had a black mayor and and we had a, a very loud, a very threatening, a very sadistic styled uh, 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 person who was opposing this black mayor in Rudy Giuliani, who had right. really been very vocal about uh, his opposition to the mayor and the government and the direction that the city appeared to be taking. Okay. But, I mean, why would the police officers go ahead and resist some of the changes that Dinkins was uh, proposing at the time? Um, you know, you've talked about the making the Civilian Complaint Review Board independent, completely independent of the NYPD. And I think uh, Dinkins also went ahead and established the Mullen Commission to kind of root out all the, um, the corruption that was happening in the NYPD. Weren't those legitimate changes in the eyes of the public? Uh, uh, those were legitimate ch changes in the eye in the public, but let's call the thing a thing. And the reason that uh, David Dinkins received so much pushback in opposition beca was because he was a black man. And we can't uh, ignore the, the, the racial dynamic uh, involved in a lot of the pushback that he got, political pushback, some of the social pushback. You know, people felt as, as if uh, that a black person should not have that position and be in charge of this Okay. municipality and have significant control in government and uh, that was really the basis for a lot of the opposition okay now they could it could have been a, of course there was um, positional opposition to some of the the initiatives and programs that he was proposing and pushing but the the, the really the bottom line of the opposition was because he, he was a, a, a black man in, in New York yeah. City at that time. Okay. And, Ron, I want to come to you. Um, so, Giuliani essentially exploited those tensions between the NYPD, 
and the mayor. Is that, is that right? I think he did more than simply exploit them. Mm -hmm. uh, he helped in many ways to create them uh, with his candidacy running against uh, Mayor Dinkins. Right. He, in something that should sound very familiar to us today, um, repeatedly demagogued uh, fear of crime uh, right. in the public. It was much more real then than it is now. Uh, and he identified uh, the black mayor with the black criminals that right. he thought uh, needed to be suppressed with, with a much more aggressive attitude. So he both right. helped to create it right. and then exploited it for his own individual advancement. Right. Now, one of the things that uh, some of the newspapers at the time reported was that um, a lot of the police officers uh, were using the N-word and, you know, had, you know, pictures of the, um, the Mayor Dinkins uh, in sexual perverted positions and all that. But nobody seemed to have been held really accountable for all that happened during that time. Um, do you re remember anything from that time? Nobody was held even partially accountable, right. except there was one uh, uh, group of off-duty police officers right. who, who beat somebody so badly uh, that eventually one of those officers was charged uh, with a misdemeanor. Uh, okay. But ultimately, there was, yes, a complete lack of accountability right. as to the police rioters, but there was also no response by the on-duty police while the rioting was going on, they basically stepped aside and watched their brothers and sisters, mostly brothers, uh, riot in the right. streets, and thereby making the best possible case for the argument that the NYPD cannot police itself. Uh, Mark, I'm going to come to you, and uh, perhaps you could respond to um, you know what you were experiencing also at the time, because you know on-duty police officers were essentially giving you know, free passes to the uh, riding police officers. Very few, and I'm talking about on one hand, you can count those people who actually charged for some uh, level of administrative misconduct, uh, but the, the penalties were insignificant and minor. Uh, and just to, to, to build on the point that Ron stated, and, and many people understand quite clearly, uh, the police can't police the police. Right. It's just, it, 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 is, it goes against the very principles and it goes against the very culture that is created in many policing agencies and that that toxic culture, but that really circles the wagon and, and, and really depends on protection of one another and, and this kind of insulated, insular communities, us against them. So there's no way to effectively, and it should never be an expectation that the police would effectively uh, uh, police their colleagues on or off duty. It's just not an effective way to okay. manage. All right. Uh, Ron, the other thing that people have noted, and I think you have several laws, uh, you have one lawsuit against uh, Giuliani in terms right. of how he weaponizes the police against ordinary citizens. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Rudy Giuliani, when he was running for, for mayor in the race which he ultimately prevailed against right. David Dinkins, made it very clear that crime was his number one priority, right. uh, which most white people in New York City agreed with, and a lot of African Americans agreed with too. It was, you know, it was a real problem. Right. And he made it clear that his solution was to unleash the police, which he did right. uh, in the most aggressive possible fashion, uh, resulting in endless stops and frisks, beatings, attacks, and in some cases, police killings of, of people of color. And that's what he became kind of famous for when you talk about, quote, cleaning up New York. Okay. When white people in New York City look back at, at Rudy Giuliani, this was the guy who stopped crime, cleaned up crime in New York City, notwithstanding the fact that crime continued to fall under Bloomberg and fell further under de Blasio. But that was the reputation he got because he was always on the side of the police, no matter what the police did. Okay. So when we now bring it into contemporary American politics and looking at the events of January 6th, should we be surprised that Giuliani was also issuing this clarion call for law and order at the same I time? Guess, I, I guess the answer is really, who are we? Because, because when Rudy got the reputation right. of America's mayor, right. it was because he was so calm and steady uh, on September 11th and the next day. Right. And America, 
probably thought, that's the guy who's been running New York City. Right. But that was not the guy who was running New York City. That was a guy who stepped out of character for a couple of days, really rose to the occasion. Right. The guy that was running New York City was the guy who was standing on a flatbed truck with his, his shirt sleeves rolled up in front of 10,000 off-duty white cops screaming, bull bull Now do it! Right. And Mark, I'd like to come to you. Should we be surprised that law enforcement was also part of the uh, January 6th uh, riots? Or no, insurrection? not at all. Uh -huh. Shouldn't be surprised at all in regards to that. Let me bounce back to something, because a lot of people, when they talk about this America's mayor uh, 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 image that's outside of New York, clearly, as Ron indicated, because in New York, there's a whole different vibe about Giuliani. But uh, the one is the, the crime decrease that he takes so much credit for really started based on the uh, Safe City, Safe Streets uh, program and planning of David Dinkins, uh, who de he defeated right. uh, from a second term. Uh, but uh, but uh, but there should be no surprise that uh, the police officers are involved, were involved in the insurrection. I think that there are far many more police officers who were involved in that insurrection on January 6th that have not been brought to justice. You know, you've had police officers, even New York police officers who were uh, appropriately charged. One was retired. One was an active New York City police officer who was charged from the insurrection. But it's it's the police officer toxic culture mentality that 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 will allow or provide for for those individual police officers to be at something like an insurrection. I mean, if you could still follow behind Rudy Giuliani after knowing what he was and what he did and how he really felt about police uh, in okay. in New York, right. then you're a fool. And, and 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 quite frankly, at the end of Giuliani's term, the police hated him. Right. <laughs> so, Ron, I'd like to come back to you. Could you talk a little bit about the case that you have against uh, Giuliani, if you can? Mine is one of the smaller cases <laughs> uh, that are against Giuliani. Right. Um, it just in terms of civil cases, right. I'm like the last in line in front of multiple ex-wives right. for whatever is left <laughs> of Rudy Giuliani's uh -huh. money. Uh, but mine was a, a very simple one. Uh, Rudy Giuliani was campaigning for his son Andrew's vanity run for the Republican nomination for governor right. on Staten Island. He's doing a meet and greet in a Staten Island shop, right? Uh, shaking hands, pressing the flesh, sort of typical thing. And my client, you know, who worked at ShopRite, a stock clerk, you know, very nice guy, mm -hmm. union member, walked over, touched Rudy on the back and said, what's up, using an, an epithet. Um, Rudy originally uh -huh. said he wasn't injured. He told the police who were called, no, I'm not injured, I'm fine, but I want that dirty so-and-so arrested, went on like, like tirades, like, like grandpa. Okay. At the very end of the table, he's like yelling at the police about Joe Biden and oh. Eric Adams and this guy. And eventually the police do what he wants. They arrest my guy. Oh. They put him through the system. Giuliani is claiming that he felt like he had been shot. He almost fell and broke his head. Uh, his shoulder hurts. He suggested on the radio oh. that he had to have a stent put into his heart because of this attack. And then the video was released right. showing Nothing of the sort happened. So who are you going to believe, Rudy or your own eyes? Definitely your own eyes, you know. Anyway, great discussion. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll discuss the Proud Boys and the continuing threat of white domestic terrorism in this country. I'm Kato Gashiro, and this is Let It Rip. Welcome back. I'm Kato Gashiro, and this is Let It Rip. Now, both the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security released reports indicating that white terrorism is the biggest domestic threat in the United States. Those reports are not surprising given the involvement of the Proud Boys in the January 6th insurrection. Now, recently, Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio was sentenced to 22 years in prison. His co-defendants, Ethan Nordine, Joseph Biggs, Zachary Rell, and Dominic Pizzola were each sentenced to between 10 to 18 years in prison on various charges. Now back to help us discuss the January 6th insurrection and the continuing threat of white terrorism is Ron Kuby and Mark Claxton. Thank you for staying with us. Mark, I'm gonna come back to you with this one. Why is there this pervasive sense of white supremacy within law enforcement? Yeah, at the, at the, for, for decades, uh, people have made the association with uh, extremism and domestic violent white uh, extremism, which is appropriately called now. 
with uh, with being in law enforcement and that there had been an infiltration in law enforcement by some uh, very violent uh, white ex extremists or white nationalists. So that's been a, an accusation for, for many decades. There's a lot of information that supports that. It's nothing new. I think the attention and the focus on it is because the FBI themselves have have uh, officially uh, substantiated those claims and those allegations. But that's not going to be any surprise because the, the movement in some uh, police agencies across the nation, you know, will logically lead people to believe that there's something other than just normal bias involved in some of the actions of some uh, uh, sworn police officers. Right. But how do you reconcile the fact that, um, you know, either the extreme right has always been support, supportive of law enforcement, but it seems that as soon as law enforcement is doing something against their, their interests, then they push back on them. What would you say to that? Well, I, what I say to that is what I've been telling my colleagues for a very long time and even during the last uh, presidential election when so many law enforcement organizations were just, just running to fall over themselves to endorse uh, uh, Donald Trump is that uh, the right-wing extremists have never had any true love or appreciation for professional law enforcement. You're a tool, and you will be used as a tool appropriately, and if you do something that threatens their existence or their liberty, then they cast you aside. And you see right now that it is the extreme right that is calling for defunding the police, eradication of the police, elimination of the FBI and right. DEA, et cetera. So it, it, there's no uh, true love or affinity. That's all nonsense. It's sort of like them being the the, the crime, you know, the, the, the party okay. that stands with the military and is against crime. It's all nonsense. All right. Ron, you said something in the last segment and said you can't really trust the police to police themselves. So what are some of the things that folks can do in order to address the white, you know, white supremacy within law enforcement? Well, that's a wonderful question because it's not something that occurred the past 10 years or 20 no. or 40. Right. Um, you know, it, it is, with due respect, inherent in, in the nature of policing. I mean, policing exists primarily to protect uh, the powerful and moneyed interest against the other. Right. whoever the other happens to be. A uh, hundred years ago, the other were Italians and Hungarians and other and Jews and other new immigrants right. who were seen to be not fully supportive of, of democracy. And black people in America were always the other right. because of slavery uh, and, and the legacy of segregation. So I don't know that there's any, any easy answers except to diversify police forces as right. we see that happening and very aggressive law enforcement. I mean, look, I'm originally from Ohio right. and Kansas, and I know these goobers, and I can assure you that <laughs> as much as they, they like to show up dressed in firearms, right. they enjoy their lives sitting there in their trailer parks drinking Bud Light Lime, okay. going out in a little boat now and then. Right. They don't want they're not going to actually participate in a civil war right. where the United States military is flying Apache attack helicopters against okay. them. Uh, they can create terrorism and they can engage right. in individual acts of terrorism. We've right. seen a lot of that. But, but I don't think that, that this sort of white supremacist civil war scenario is a particularly likely one. Right. But even when we look at uh, some of the reports coming out of the FBI uh, that has indicated, as uh, Mark stated, is that you've had white supremacist organizations um, essentially infiltrating law enforcement. And that may perhaps explain why at the Capitol riots you did not see a forceful um, representation of, of folks who really wanted to stop the riot. What would you say to that? I think that, that that's correct. And I also, to... to tack on to, to Mark's point, the, the right wing, the white right wing in America has always backed the blue as long as the blue is directed at the black. Mm -hmm. Once the blue is directed at white people, you know, the back the blue folks are, no, 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 right. not us, <laughs> him, that guy. Right. So, Mark, is there any sense that diversity will actually 
mitigate some of the, um, the white supremacist strains within the law enforcement? Um, I don't believe so. And, and this isn't necessarily a popular opinion, especially uh, with the uh, law enforcement organizations, uh, you know, black and Latino law enforcement organizations who promote diversity. I, I promote and believe in diversity, but I don't believe that uh, diversifying your police force will make it less oppressive and less impacted by the evils of white supremacy. You have unfortunately, some police departments that are majority black or brown in this nation who are still practicing uh, uh, the, the, the very same kind of things that the white supremacist uh, uh -huh. agencies do. And that's because uh, they're, the toxic police culture, police culture right. subsumes even your very own experiences and reality. So if you buy into the culture and that culture is toxic in your law enforcement agency, it wouldn't make a difference if so, you were a, a black or white. So when you say or, toxic, or when mm -hmm. you say toxic, does that necessarily mean that the white supremacist strain within law enforcement or the racism that is rife within law enforcement is something that is going to be taken care of by greater accountability? Or is there credence to some advocates who say that you should just defund the police and move that money, reallocate that money to things like housing, uh, poverty, education? I'm curious to what you'd say to that. I think reallocation of, of resources should be looked at a case by case basis. There are some uh, areas and some areas in the country, because we have to remember we're thinking you know, across the nation, there are some agencies that can better uh, allocate their resources and to give more effective uh, policing, if you will, or public safety. Even shift the entire policing model to a public safety model. Okay. Uh, Ron, I want to come back to one point that you made in terms of um, the likelihood of a civil war. Uh, you've heard people like Tucker Carlson um, and uh, Sarah Palin, you know, almost intimate that... <laughs> the Warriors! <laughs> right. Both. But yes, I can arrest. see Tucker, the Swanson family heir right. on the front lines of but the let revolution. Me finish, let me finish my question. <laughs> that if you come back and um, if you arrest Donald Trump and have him imprisoned, that it might spark exactly what you think might not happen, which is a civil war. I'm curious what your, your response would be. I, I don't think uh, civil war is really likely under, under any foreseeable set of circumstances, precisely because most of the people who are talking about it are people who have something to lose okay. by a civil war. I mean, part of the genius of America has always been when people get excited enough right. to take up arms en masse, they end up getting bought off. Um, most white people in America, as angry as they are, kind of like the lives that they have and, and don't want to sit around in the rain crawling through the mud in a civil war. Okay. And I think the decision, to, to make a decision to say it's too divisive mm -hmm. to prosecute Donald Trump, we're too afraid of the consequences, that is exactly the type of political consideration which should have no role in deciding who gets prosecuted and who does not. Okay. Uh, Mark, I'm going to come to you uh, with a final point and question. Uh, what do you say to the same assertion that uh, the prosecution of uh, Donald Trump might lead to a civil war? I don't, I don't think that that will be the case, but let me, let, me, let me do my New York thing and tell you that most of the guys that I see barking the loudest about creation of a civil war I think on a one and one, I beat them. So I'm not and and okay. I'm saying that to say that the loudest barkers, right. I'm not concerned with them. And I, I, I think my odds are pretty good on the fade. So. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's hope you're both right because, um, you know, the, F the FBI thinks otherwise. But anyway, great discussion, uh, but we'll have to end it here. Uh, I want to thank both our guests, Ron Kuby and Mark Claxton, for their brilliant insight. Let's take a short break, and when we come back, let's discuss the impact of Dion Primetime Sanders is having on the college football scene. I'm Kero Gishiro, and this is Let It Rip. Last year, after three successful seasons with Jackson State University, a historically black college, Dion Sanders accepted the University of Colorado's offer to coach the football team. Sanders was criticized for leaving Jackson State for Colorado because the school took a chance on him to coach his football team when other schools would not, 
and he managed to compile an impressive record of 27 wins and five losses, which included an undefeated season in 2022, a first in the school's history. He also won back-to-back -back Southwestern Athletic Conference Championships and brought the school unprecedented national exposure. This impressive performance, some thought, would be enough for Sanders to stay and build out Jackson State's football program. But the Hall of Fame athlete, now coach, had other plans. Without question, Dion's style and flair is a major contrast to the status quo. He was recently quoted saying, I truly make a difference. I make folks nervous. This level of confidence and flair is something we haven't seen in a long time, especially coming from a black coach. The spotlight is on Deion Sanders and he knows it. Some are watching hoping Sanders will fail. Others are watching Sanders make history as a black man on one of the biggest stage in sports. I'm Kato Gishoro and this is Let It Rip.